Good morning, and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Bryan's pre-recorded worship service for Sunday, September the 20th. We are glad and grateful that you are joining us this morning. Today, uh, different from the previous 11 weeks, uh, we are starting a new series. Uh, we're no longer on our journey with the stained glass windows in the sanctuary built in 1966. Uh, we are uh, exploring what's called the great ends of the church. There are six of those are the great goals of the church and we will take those one at a time beginning this morning and we, we are glad you're going to a journey with us in that exploration. You will notice in our pre-recorded service uh, as it is that just following that our director of music ministries, David Kipp, is absent. He's traveling today as we film and he will be with us on the church parking lot Sunday morning. If you're following the service this morning on your cell phone, you will notice uh, below the right side of the picture there is a gray chevron. If you will click on that chevron, unfolding below will be a, a readable form of the church bulletin for this service. If you are following on a um, computer, you will move over and look down to the left side and about three lines down, there are the words, show more. If you click there, the bulletin will unfold for you to see. If you're following on a uh, television that is uh, with your computer and you would like to see the printed form of the service, simply go to the church website, www.fpcbryan.org and a printed form of the service will be available there. We are grateful that you are worshiping with us today as we first explore the great ends of the church. Again this morning, friends, we are worshiping God. to our worship today and we find in the book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 52 verse 7 we find these words how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace who brings good news who announces salvation and says your God reigns as sovereign let us join together in singing of hymn 462, I'd Love to Tell the Story. Oh, 
Will you join me in our praise and confession? Confessing to God how we have failed to live faithfully with sin, with brokenness, being part of our identity and relationships every day, let us begin with a prayer in silence. May we pray together. O oh, gracious and ever-present one, we can list our failings and our offenses in relation to you and to others, and still never remember them completely. Forgive us, though, of all our sin. Restore us to a repaired and empowered life for serving you moment by moment and day by day in the way and spirit of Jesus Christ, always to the glory of your holy name. Friends, let us hear and share with gladness the blessed news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. now hear the word of God, a reading from the letter to the Romans by Paul, chapter 10, verse 14. The third part of that verse, which is actually a question, the word of God. And how are people to hear without someone to proclaim? And may I repeat that? And how are people to hear without someone to proclaim? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When two persons marry, whether they bring children to the marriage or not, they bring their past and their present or the past into the present. And, and what they bring may be property or other assets. In the case of church communions or denominations, they may bring statements from their respective traditions. And back in 1910, the United Presbyterian Church of North America, uh, the initials being uh, UPCNA, uh, they adopted a statement called the great ends of the church or the great goals of the church. Uh, the UPCNA was a, a denomination with Scottish roots uh, of the Presbyterian faith family, mostly in the Ohio River Valley in southeast Ohio and uh, western Pennsylvania. In 1958, the UPCNA merged with the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. And that statement that they had made of the great ends of the church, the great goals of the church, uh, really they meant for any denomination, any communion of people who would seek to follow Jesus Christ, they brought that to their marriage with the United Presbyterian Church in uh, the, it became the United Presbyterian Church in the United States of America um, when they united in 1958. Well, when the United Presbyterian Church in the USA merged with the Presbyterian Church in the United States, if this isn't too much for you, that was the old Southern Presbyterian Church. When they remarried, 
after the great divorce of 1861 in the Civil, at the start of the Civil War, when they remarried or got back together in 1983, the great ends of the church was brought forward from uh, the, the church that merged with uh, the old Scottish church there in the Ohio Valley. So that's how the great ends of the church is still part of uh, this merging group of Presbyterians which uh, brought us into the family in 1983 from the Southern Presbyterian Church. So the great ends of the church, the great goals of the church, for the first one is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. And we're gonna look at those one at a time for the next uh, few weeks. The 1611 version of the King James translation of the Bible from Greek to English utilizes the words uh, at Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how shall they hear without a preacher? And if you and I ask, how shall we hear what? The what is the gospel. It's the life-changing news of God's love embodied in Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what Paul has been uh, writing about uh, and comes to that point in chapter 10 in this letter to the church at Rome. But I think it is important not to overly churchify uh, this uh, statement uh, in this question. In other words, for preacher not to be understood as a clergy person, um, a priest or a pastor, uh, someone who's been theologically trained and ordained uh, to uh, the ministry of the professional church. Uh, a, more literal, a more literal translation of Paul's sentence here is, how shall they hear without a proclaimer? Uh, the Greek word is uh, keruso. Um, and how shall they, we'll try this, how shall they hear without a messenger of what is good and sacred? Now, you can understand how preacher is limiting in a church setting because it does tend to refer to uh, the paid uh, church professional or Bible professional or preaching professional. Uh, when I served in the uh, second half of the 1980s and the first half of the 1990s as the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Henderson, Texas, uh, there in East Texas, Oscar Orr and Max Reinbach used to call me preacher. That's all they ever called me was preacher. Oscar was probably 45 years older than I was, and he called me preacher until the day he died. And Max was about my age, and he called me preacher and still does on those rare occasions when we see each other. The Greek word, when literally translated, means one who proclaims. Now certainly that can be done in an address based on scripture that lasts seven or eight minutes or it may last 20 or 25 minutes or even more. You perhaps also have heard the phrase though attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. This is a paraphrase, not necessarily from St. Francis himself, but a form of what is written in the book of order that's to be followed by all Franciscan brothers. That statement is, all the friars, all the brothers, wherever they are, should preach by their deeds. Now, if the order of Franciscans uh, as, as a group, if they are sniffing down the trail of something significant, uh, which is more, it is more than churchifying a word. It's more than saying that the recognized or paid specialist in Bible and theology training is the preacher to be heard. Then we can ask the important question, are they're those who preach to the preacher, to the church professionals. And if so, who are they? Once in a while, the phrase is spoken, 
he or she is a preacher's preacher. This means, I think, someone uh, is so gifted that her style or his style speaks to many others who are proclaimers of God's good news uh, as trained personnel in their religious communities. So if you and I were sitting down over a glass of iced tea or a cup of coffee or hot tea, I, I could give you a short list of the preachers and the proclaimers who have most stirred my mind and soul at various points in my life through their addresses, through their sermons related to Scripture. And some of those names you might recognize and some you might not recognize. And if I ask you who among the preachers you have heard uh, who have stirred your heart and mind and soul at different points in your life, you could tell me the name of some of those as well. You might even tell me a sermon or two which you particularly remember. And, and I might recognize some of those names and others I would not recognize because we have walked different paths for the most part. The deal with any leader or preacher, though, is a need for congruence to word and deed. Who hasn't heard it said of someone, well, she or he is a great preacher in the public address category, but hardly seems to care for anyone outside of a very tight group of friends? Or who hasn't heard it said of someone else? He or she is not a great preacher as preachers go, but is a caring, insightful, and positive pastor and friend and leader. Maybe then the importance is not eloquence and polish and shine as a preacher or proclaimer. Maybe the importance is closer to congruence of the gospel and the way that the preacher, proclaimer, and sharer of the gospel relates with integrity. What is that person's credibility? What is that person's degree of openness to God's spirit in Christ? What is that person's indication or reflection of commitment to the gospel? How shall we hear if not for a preacher, proclaimer, sharer? I do have the list of preachers who have been influential in the shaping of faith and uh, life as faith has been part of my own identity. Yet I also have non-professional theologians and non-professional preachers, proclaimers, sharers of the gospel who have influenced my life. They have lived in my hometown, where I went to college, where I went to seminary, where I have worked at camps and hospitals and churches. They have been Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Roman Catholics. They have been Jews and Muslims and Republicans and Democrats. They have been male and female, younger and older. They have been married, never married, divorced, widowed, etc. Every time such proclaimers of God's good news have influenced me, I have seen the spirit and manner of Jesus evident in their relationships with me and their relationships with others whether Jesus' name was ever mentioned or not. They have each encouraged and shaped and molded my journey in faith and hope and love and study and service. Not one of them has pronounced me finished or complete. In fact, more than one of those has said to me at some point, Foot, you've got to put more thought into that. You've got to expand your perspective on that. You've got a ways to go in the growth 
that you need to accomplish. And they have been correct. So the answer to the question, who preaches to the preacher, is you do. You and others. Even as non-professionally degreed preachers, proclaimers, and sharers of the gospel, you embody God's grace alive in you in such a way that someone else sees the manner and spirit of God's gospel in you. Someone else sees in you the liberating good news embodied in Jesus Christ even when Jesus' name is never mentioned. Remember Abraham Lincoln's concluding words during his first inaugural address, March 4th, 1861, one month before the beginning of the Civil War. As citizens of a single nation, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone over this broad land will yet swell with the chorus of the Union when those cords of memory are once again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Friends, Paul was not a heavenly angel as such. He was not a celestial messenger come to earth to leave a message beginning with the church members at Rome with this letter. Paul was, as you are and as I am, a preacher and proclaimer and sharer of the manner and spirit of Jesus Christ. So whatever our differences of background, opinion, and preference, the better angels of our nature are the qualities that God has placed within us. We cannot hear except as God helps us to hear through one another. Who preaches, proclaims, and shares the manner and spirit of Jesus Christ with any given preacher or anyone else? You do. And I do, as Paul and his associates did long before us. Pray God to keep helping us hear the proclaiming and the sharing of the gospel through one another. Preachers, proclaimers, and sharers, as God has equipped each of us always to be. All honor and praise be to God. Friends, let us join together in singing hymn number 361, O Christ, the Great Foundation.
Let us pray. O one upon the throne of the universe, outpouring your very self in redeeming love among persons of all backgrounds and in all times and places, receive our thanks for your gifts in abundance and for abundant life. Tune the melodies of gratitude and appreciation within us for the sacrifices of previous generations, for the strengths of democracy, for liberation from whatever enslaves, for the generosity of time, talent, and resources which persons contribute to aid one another and increase the common good, for opportunities of service and fellowship witnessing to and reinforcing your blessing of care and love for each girl and boy, woman and man. Deliver each individual and every group from fears and self-absorption, from envy and resentment, from apathy and miserliness, from debilitating illness and injury physical and emotional, from resistance to reconciliation and new relational possibilities, from capitulation to cultural pressures and destructive influences. In the way and spirit of Jesus Christ, change and guide us to cherish your wisdom to sense the communion you create among those of past and present, to embrace your majestic desire for communities of respect and peace, and to celebrate the risks of discipleship you encourage us to exercise. Hear us also praying now, as Jesus taught the community of faith to believe and give voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, when you go out into the world today, go out knowing that you are here to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Go out in such a way that we may live and move and have our being all in God's grace and God's love, so that when anyone shall look upon us, they shall know by the way that we are the very good things that God is doing in our lives. And may you do so in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.